Good morning, everybody. I think I'm live. Happy Monday, everyone. I'm looking at our thread. Lots of buddies on our thread this morning. Let's see who's here. Oh, it's good to see you. I feel like it's been so long and we even had a big blowout on Friday night. I still feel like it's been forever since we've been together like this. Good morning, Crystal. But candy filled weekends, I know it, right? And since we we had very few trick or treaters, we've been eating like dirty little pigs, just snack after snack after snack. I feel like I'm gonna explode. Teddy had the first tummy ache of his life and it scared me because I thought maybe it was his appendix about to explode or something, but of course it wasn't. It was just way too much candy and eggnog because have you noticed that's in the store already? And now that Halloween is over, I have to ask you, is it too early to wear my little cookie, my little cookie tree necklace, it probably is. But I figured this is like a landmark. We got past the first holiday. And as my grandmother used to say, once you hit Halloween, it's like a landslide until you get to the new year. It's so true too. Good morning, Cece. Good morning, Joelle, Amber, Catherine. Hello, Cynthia, Chris, Penny. There you are, Chrissy. Look at that gingerbread house rug. Oh, I... Yes, it's going to be a great episode today. I have a great episode. It's going to be at least a two-parter. Good morning, Doreen and Linda. Good morning, Julie and Linda H. from Massachusetts and Sheila. Good morning, April, Donna. Oh, it's good to see you all chatting. Hello, Brandy in Texas. Oh, my mom's on too. What a great weekend we had. <laughs> I'm reading your comments. It's funny. Yeah, it is windy as anything out there. You do not want to Mary Poppins it off the roof. I hope that's not what the kids are doing. They're so quiet up there. I know we used to jump off the roof with an umbrella. I don't know if you know that, Mom, but Gail did, and she almost broke her leg one time. Good morning, Chris and Karen, Cynthia, Amy. Good morning, Jay, Lisa, Beverly. Beverly, your rug was so great. And I did that long um, Halloween rug review on Saturday. I wanted to show all the rugs that had been sent. Um, and then a few others that I had been going back and forth with their makers on earlier and the designers. Uh, so it was a super long edition. If you made it through, great job. But it's once a year that I can do a Halloween edition. And you know, that's my favorite for rugs anyway. Uh, and I enjoyed that immensely. So it was a really great weekend. It was, um, it was the first time that we stayed with my mom um, you know, that the kids and I had stayed over since like February because of everything that's going on this year. So it was so nice to be back. And do you know when you do things in a certain place and the association is always there, like watching Christmas Hallmark movies too early? That's what I did a lot of. Um, it's just so nice to be back, Mom. I'm so glad that we went. We had such a good weekend. And my mom is such a great artist. I remember her growing up doing lots of folk art type design. She painted lots of plaques. In those days, there used to be like it, the 80s, there used to be a lot of stores that sold wood where you could buy plaques or things for over the door, staves and things and paint them yourself. And she did tons of that stuff. In fact, this summer when we were on Cape Cod, I took a side trip and I drove to the house where we used to live because one of her beautiful plaques that was a painting of that house was above uh, the trellis. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was still there. I think I took a picture and sent it, but it's just nice to see that work living on. So we decided this weekend that my mom is working on some designs for us for holidays because she is a phenomenal artist. It'll be great to get some new designs in the store because I'm pretty busy at this moment with, um, <laughs> with, um, fulfilling orders. So thank you so much, mom. That's going to be great to, uh, to get that done. So let's see what we have. It's a really jam packed show today. I'm not even sure where to begin. I'm so excited and overwhelmed. Uh, let me begin with some of the business stuff. So bingo was great. Thank you so much. And congratulations to the four winners. Two of the four winners have already redeemed their um, prize in the store. Um, somebody's getting wool to dye and um, uh, do, you know, basic base stuff with, and somebody else ordered a pattern. So that is so great. One of the Nancy Thomases, that is so great. And you can, th those are good forever. So who the last two people with the certificates, absolutely take your time. There's always more stuff coming out. This week, just so you know, the sweater kits are still going strong and they're still selling like crazy. This week, later in the week, I got a new batch of sweaters. I bought a ton of sweaters. I'll be washing them, prepping them, and I'll be putting sweater sort of charm squares into the ribbon candy hooking store. So if you don't want a kit, but you do want to hook with sweaters later this week, probably more like Thursday, Friday, I'll, I'll start and I'll let you know when I do, I'm going to start putting those charm squares into the store so you can buy them by color. 
um, and by size, not just by weight, because to me, weight means nothing. You need to know how big the squares are because you know when you hook them, they're going to come out about a quarter the size of what you start with. So you have to keep that into account when you're planning your patterns and buying your supplies. I know Linda, she's such a good, she's, my mom is such a good designer. She was the wolf in the bingo video. She took her mask off because she couldn't drink her cocktail with the mask on. And the funny thing is we've been calling her wolf um, for like 20 years. And it dates back to a period in our family where we used to go to the ceramic store a lot. And at the ceramic store where they had all the greenware sitting out on the shelf, the woman who had the shop kept this giant like Great Dane. And every time the door opened, the bell rang and he was super friendly and would wag his tail. And when he wagged his giant tail, the greenware would fall off the shelf and smash. And she would roll up a newspaper and crack him on the butt. And he would go, row. And it, it was totally heartbreaking and made us not want to shop with this woman because obviously this is not an appropriate pet to have in a pottery store. But um, from that point on, when we would arrive home, my sister and I, we used to open the front door and go, row, to see if my mom was home. And she would answer from another part of the house or the basement or outside. And it sounded like a wolf call. So we started calling her wolf about 20 years ago. And you can too on this thread. It hasn't stopped and it hopefully will never stop but she's gonna do some phenomenal designing. We've already started um, talking about themes and stuff. So bingo was wonderful and we will do a monthly bingo. I will change the card up a little bit so there's different things to call each time. Sorry, it was long for some people. I know someone was saying faster, they were ready to eat, um, but it wasn't extended. It was a double show. So it went the full hour on Friday. So if you play next time with us, expect to spend an hour because it's gonna take that long to make the calls and fool around and sip drinks. So anyway, um, I just wanted to, let me start with some business stuff, like I said. So while I was at my mom's, we got talking about it being November. And I was kind of holding my breath for October and Halloween and making it right for the kids with everything being so strange and not really letting them go out trick-or-treating. So um, my all of my energy and thought was focused on that. And then I realized the day after it was November and I had not done my November kit for our group. Um, and I had not even thought about the design. So I sat down with my mom and we came up with a wonderful design because she's always on coffee time too. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Um, and, and we said, why don't we do, because we've been talking about Helen Albee and the Abenaki rugs. And then in bingo, I had that as a square. And I talked about using Native American designs as rug designs in the very early 20th century, 1920s, 1930s. So we decided I did not want to do a corny sort of Macy's Day Parade, um, typical American looking um, turkey. I thought it was a bit too cliche. So we came up with a design that is like a Native American type turkey. And I don't have it in color yet because I'm in the middle of dying for it. I think it's going to be an all yarn kit, but this is bulky yarn, very, very easy to hook. I'm just going to give you a sneak preview of the design because I haven't shown it yet. I hope you can see this okay. But it's a line drawing, kind of like a cave painting. And if it looks busy, it's not busy. Those little flecks you see are, are going to be done with yarn and it's all outlined. So the, the bird is outlined, the hills are outlined, the background is going to be changing between like teal, uh, dark indigo blue and like sort of aubergine. And the pop colors are going to be like a yellow ochre, sort of a new, uh, an old gold. Um, um, what else? Kind of an orangey. I'm trying to think of what I dyed last night. Um, dark, dark, dark navy is the outline color. And of course, white, natural, not white. So the turkey is going to be in the natural color and it's going to resemble a cave painting, but based on Native American motifs, a little bit of cave facet in the border because I can't, I can't resist. But um, I'm going to try to finish dyeing today and I'm going to hook it. Karen, the kits are always $45. It, the, the piece itself is on monk's cloth or linen, and you can say, it doesn't matter which, it's the same price. Um, and it comes with all of the yarn to complete this. So it's going to be a few days before. It's probably going to take me um, a, a day and a half to two days to hook it. It's 10 by 10, always $45, including the um, supplies, um, plus shipping on ribboncantyhooking.com. But as soon as I hook it, I will know exactly how much yarn to include in the kit. And I will give you a lot of extra, of course, um, in case you get into substituting colors and things like that. But I wanted to do kind of a hat tip this time for um, Me Too, Sheila. They're, you know, these sort of Santa Fe native colors are not really my thing. I go for the really bright neons usually. So this is a bit of a stretch for me, which is always good. 
Um, so when I saw the colors out drying last night, I thought, nah, but you know what, when I, when it's hooked, I bet it's going to be beautiful because those colors like paprika teal remind me of the house where I grew up, where all the first Thanksgivings happened for us and all of the historic inns that we always go to around that time of year. Those are the kind of um, historic colonial type colors that they used. So I bet it will be beautiful. I hope it, it turns out well. And I just wanted to mention before I get into the real subject of the day, with these Native American designs, we talked about Helen Albee and her book. Um, and I ordered the book from Amazon. And this is the book. And this isn't what we're doing today. But I just wanted to let you know, this is a to be continued. So this is a reprint from 1909. Um, it's one of these print on demand books, right? So the text looks like this. But I have to tell you, there is not one picture drawn or photo of a rug in this book. There is no picture, not one, not even for the front piece, not for the cover. So if you are thinking about this book or have ordered this book from Amazon, you, you know you can return it. You can just bring them to Kohl's. If you have a Kohl's near you, you don't even need a box for it. You just hand it in and they give you a receipt and mail it for you. Um, and then you buy 20 things accidentally while you're there, which is the whole point, right? But um, I, I'm keeping this book for myself because it's it's got some history in it. It's not super long. There's a ton of dye recipes in the back for Native American colors. A lot of those are the colors I pulled on to come up with the color scheme for this month's kit. Um, like terracotta type colors, that kind of thing, paprika. That was the one I was missing, terracotta. But I cannot recommend it as an inspiration book because there are absolutely no pictures or sketches in the book. It is all text. I will keep the book because she talks about a lot about dyeing, care of rug, Morden's temperature, that kind of thing, shading, clipping. Um, but she talks in the intro for a few pages about stencils and composition. So um, I'm going to keep it and I'm going to get the best parts out of it and, and share them with you here. Um, so for me, I'm keeping the book. This is the only picture in the book. Um, so that's not great, great inspiration. But we will still be inspired by this book. I'm just letting you know that if you are tempted to get it because the idea of Native American um, designs and colors seems like something you might be inspired by, that's the wrong book for that purpose. So today, okay, so fairy tale rugs. Now, the way that I got onto this, as all great things, as all great rabbit, rabbit holes are found, as Alice well, well knows in Wonderland, right? Um, my mom sent me an email last weekend, not this past weekend, but last weekend. Um, and it was like she forwarded something interesting that she had found on Sarah Hale, who was an American poet and um, very famous for having written Mary Had a Little Lamb, uh, among a lot of other things. And I'm going to start here and you're going to see how this connects to rug hooking and to the book that happened to be on my bedside table when my mom sent me this message. All things connect, all roads lead to Rome, right? So just stick with me for a minute because I think this is interesting of, in and of itself. So she forwarded me this thing about Sarah Hale because it was her birthday last weekend or would have been. Um, she was born in 1788 in Newport, New Hampshire. So obviously she's not, she's not alive at this point. Um, but we are thankful to Sarah Hale uh, for her push to make Thanksgiving a holiday. Yes, we're already talking about Thanksgiving uh, in the US. And she was also the author of Mary Had a Little Lamb. So in terms of who she was, a woman in this period, you know I love talking about women's lives from the sort of colonial era of the US and up because women have parallel, separate and different lives. There's no disputing that. And I'm not even a feminist and I can see that a mile away. So Sarah had no formal education uh, but her family, especially her brother, encouraged her to read, and thus she was able to read and write. Her brother ended up going to Dartmouth, which is our New England, uh, one of our Ivy League schools here. So her father opened up a tavern and was unsuccessful, unfortunately, in business. Um, but she herself, Sarah, was married in that tavern, and she had five children. But like a lot of women from this period, um, her husband died when she was only 34, and she was left with these children, a young family, and her, her husband was a Mason. So the Freemason group in her immediate area, as they do, I remember this when my dad passed away, you can't imagine how many Masons came out of the woodwork from all over New England, people who had never even met him. Such a unified group, such a lovely group. But the Masons supported her after the death of her husband um, financially, uh, supported the children. Um, they even opened a business for her. She opened a millinery business first. They paid for all of that to get her supplies going. Uh, and they paid for the publication of her first book of poetry. I mean, this is extremely kind, which came out in 1823. And it was called The Genius of Oblivion. The thing about Sarah, besides Mary Had a Little Lamb, and besides her quite serious and beautiful poetry, 
is that she was a huge and vocal supporter of Thanksgiving. So you might have heard the story before, but I hadn't heard of it in this detail. Um, she was big into social causes. Remember our Friday episode two, we were talking about one of our rug cooking artists from the storytelling book, big into social causes and using the little sort of platform that she had in her community to push that. She wrote letters to all of these presidents to push them to make Thanksgiving a national holiday. First, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and then James Buchanan. And when none of that worked, she wrote to the next president, Abraham Lincoln. And you probably already know, he is the president that made Thanksgiving a holiday. Uh, on October 3rd, 1863, he officially, I won't read the long quote because it's almost as long as a Gettysburg address. It's very verbose. But um, he writes about how important it was, you know, for uh, to share our bounties under the fruitful, you know, fruitful, fruitful ground and healthy sky and, you know, all of the things that were associated with the new world. So on November, sorry, October 3rd, 1863, he makes Thanksgiving a holiday as we used to know it every third Thursday. I think that's probably different now. Thanks, Olivia. Don't forget to thumbs up everybody. That helps me a lot with the visibility of the channel. So we have Sarah to thank for Thanksgiving, which we have coming up and we'll be thinking about the Canadians just had Thanksgiving, right? So we're in slightly different um, zones with our holidays, but we can still enjoy each other's holidays. We'll celebrate twice. Um, so she, we can thank her for Thanksgiving, but we can also thank her for Mary Had a Little Lamb. Um, and then I started thinking, that got me going on, where did I put them? On rugs that featured a fairy tale theme. I'm sure you can picture some because I immediately pictured like a whole bunch. So I started to research rugs with, with not fairy tale themes, nursery rhyme themes, because a lot, remember a lot of the early art is pulled from illustrations of the time, things that would be in newspapers that, you know, children were often addressed in newspapers. Children had their own publications, even in the 19th century. Uh, and a lot of art was pulled from those sources. So you get a lot of very simple fairy tale nursery rhyme art in the early hook tracks. So I pulled up some images of some of the Mary Had a Little Lambs um, that I found and some interesting things about them. So this is the first one I pulled up. This came out of Country Living Magazine in 2007, okay? And it was part of a discussion about what's this worth? You know, this has always been a big thing like pre-Antiques Roadshow, what's this worth? So the appraiser is Helene Fendelman and she gets this question, what's this rug worth? And this is the rug. It's a Mary had the li a little lamb uh, motif. And I, I was not able to find another pattern of exactly this, which might mean I just couldn't find it. It's not on the internet, number two. Uh, number three, it's possibly hand-drawn. So it could be any of those. If you know different, please let me know. I love to be wrong. I love to find out. Help me learn some good stuff too. So Helen writes when she, when she appraises this rug in 2007 for $650, she says animals are particularly favored images for, ho for hooked rugs. Adding human figures, especially children, increases their value. Your rug depicts the 1830 nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb, which was written by Sarah Josepha Buell Hale. This hooked rug lately dates to the 1940s based on the colors that are used and possibly made from a pattern. She also doesn't know the source of the, of the design. Earlier rugs often do tell a charming story as this one does, especially in this kind of graphic detail. I'll show you one more time this version of Mary Had a Little Lamb. So then I found this pattern. Now this was this po this was posted and is posted on a site called Stella Rubin R U B I N Stella Rubin Antiques .com. You can actually buy the rug that I'm about to show for three hundred and seventy five dollars. Different pattern. Um, I'm going to show you. Let's focus on this one first. So Stella Rubin .com, Stella Rubin Antiques .com, This is the rug she has for sale for three seventy five of Mary Had a Little Lamb, and I'm going to tell you what she says about this. She says, Mary had a little lamb charmingly depicted in a hooked rug. Mary's shown in profile like Sunbonnet Sue. Now that's a good point because remember in the 1920s, in the Depression era, 20s and 30s, Sunbonnet Sue was a character that was used prolifically in quilting and in art, um, needlepoint, the, you know, the kind of needlepoint or paper print that somebody would get a print of out of a magazine and then add a ruffle of real lace or something, add fabric for a dress. Very popular motif, Sunbonnet Sue. Interesting that Mary's lamb is sheared, but the legs are fuzzier wool than the body. It's in pristine condition and it's in Pennsylvania. So I just want to show you this again. 
the artist obviously hooked the legs in a different material because they're coming up much fuzzier. They look almost like the novelty, like fun fur. Of course they're not because this is a 1940s rug. But um, thank you, Cece. Uh, but I thought that was interesting. And then I was able to find the bottom image that shows that this was a pattern. Again, I haven't been able to find this particular pattern, but this was on eBay and there's no, it's broken link when the link does like, uh, like it, somebody killed it and there's no more information. It was on eBay and it sold and I don't know when, but all that's left is this image, which is obviously the same one, possibly um, punched or done in reverse or possibly the photo is reversed. So it's hard to know, but it's obviously based on the same two things with, she's got something in her hand. Uh, the, the pose of the lamb here, it looks more like a dog, unless that's supposed to be a collar with a bell. Could be have been changed to a dog, but you can see the same motion. Here, the apron was omitted. Here, the apron um, was used. So interesting, right? So that's a second Mary rug uh, that I wasn't able to check the source of. And then this one, vim vintage primitive hooked rug. Mary had a little lamb, 33 by 21. This sold uh, for $72.25. Um, I'm not sure if this was eBay. I don't think it was. I think this was like an online auction. Um, there were eight bidders and it was also in Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania is where we're getting a lot of these rugs, particularly the commercial, uh, the early commercial patterns. And this is uh, Morgantown, Pennsylvania. This is this Mary rug. And I was not able online to find another one of this exact pattern. But I thought that's interesting. So right there, We've, uh, we're only talking about Mary Had a Little Lamb, just like that this morning while I was sitting having coffee, before I had coffee with you, right? Um, I was able to find three Mary Had a Little Lamb designs, and probably if I spent more time, I could um, find some more. So then I started looking at other characters from fairy tales who had been used as hook drugs, and I came up with this. This is a warning to all. So this rug I'm showing you on top, let me show you both. This is Humpty Dumpty. These are two different rugs, right? So the funny thing and a funny thing about this top rug was that it was for sale on like a fancier auction site, not eBay, but one of the fancier ones. And I don't even remember which one. And I wouldn't talk disparagingly about any of them because I shop on all of them and it's great to look. But the person who was selling the rug didn't know what they had. And they wrote vintage early hook rug, hook rug, child's Humpty Dumpty theme, nursery rhyme rug, signed C.M., Think about it. Who do you think who do you think CM is in this situation? Um, I know there's a delay, but obviously it's Claire Murray. And it is Claire Murray because this is a current rug for sale, the exact same rug, also signed by CM because it's machine made. Uh, it's a Claire Murray design. That's This one is available on Etsy right now. The shop is called Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y, Dry Goods. So my point is to be careful when you find a rug like this and someone says it's signed by the artist. If the artist is CM, that's a, that's a no brainer. It's Claire Murray and you should not pay $700 for it because it's a machine made rug. And unless it's something super collectible and rare, or you really want it and, and you can afford it and you want to boost the economy by spending, then do it. Um, but be careful with things like this because you often get sellers who don't really know what they're talking about and they're selling a Claire Murray rug and expecting it to go for a lot of money. It's not particularly vintage. It's going to be 1990s or later. And here's the one on Etsy. So if you like it, you can still grab it. This is going to be a multi-part for sure. And then thinking about that brought me to another one of the great um, um, rugs, uh, fairy tale nursery rhyme rugs. The Three Bears. Now, the Three Bears motif is the oldest and the most famous. Have you have you ever been to an antique store and seen the Three Bears rug? I'm going to show you three versions of it right here. Um, and then I'm going to tell you about this rug. So this is the Three Bears. If you, if you Google uh, Three Bears hooked rug, you will get like hundreds of results because there are so many Three Bears hooked rugs. Look at how different they can be as well. So beautiful. Um, I thought I had one more of that page. I wanted to show you one because a while ago I went to Northampton Mass. Actually, it was Florence Mass. And, oh, I have it. It's coming up. Um, and I visited Mill River uh, Rugs and did uh, on the YouTube channel. I have a tour visiting with Margaret there. And she has the original pattern for the three bears. She has one of them, blue nose pattern. And she's hooking that rug in the most exquisite way, the most exquisite version I've ever seen. So right there... And I'm going to do one more, but I'm just recapping because it's already five of. Right there, we went from Sarah Hale and Thanksgiving 
to nursery rhyme fairy tale rugs, of which there are going to be thousands, right? I just picked a few obvious ones out that I could grab quickly. Um, and that is going to bring us to a book that has been on my bedside table. I want to show you one more rug before we get to the book, if we get to the book. I'm going to show you a preview of the book because this is it. All right, so hold on the book, hold on that thought. But the last rug that I want to show you is, is a rug that I bought. Actually, my mom bought, thank you, mom, for Christmas two years ago. But it's my rug now. Um, it is, well, you'll see what it is right away. I mean, isn't this like magnificent? See the witch over here, colorful balloons, sort of uh, palmy palmetto leaves. Look at the gingerbread guys over here. This is a Jane McGowan design. More on that in a minute. And the two kids approaching this candy house. I mean, this to me, this rug is just insanely charming. And information on the back, um, it was hooked by Teresa Kruger in 1996. And she says, Hansel and Gretel by Jane McGowan. Now, before we get to that book, let me show you something else. And this probably will sadly bring us to the end of the show. So it'll be wonderful to be continued. Um, I happen to find this issue of the National Guild of Pearl McGowan Rug Hookers. And that's the one, that's not my rug. You can see that's very different from the one I just showed you. She's got the scrolling here instead of uh, the candy canes. Right, just take a look at how different these kids look. Um, it's a completely different rug, but obviously same pattern. So I found this and I wanted to share it with you because I thought it was interesting. We're gonna launch into that book tomorrow because the three bears is a garret pattern. So when I was looking up nursery rhymes because of Sarah Hale, I was reading the history on the sort of discovery of the Garrett rugs, which are the blue nose rugs. So we will launch into Canada history tomorrow. But let me share with you in the end of this episode what's inside this Promagow newsletter because this is so interesting relating to the Jane, to the Jane McGowan rug. So this is um, volume number 43 and it's number four. And I just want to tell you what this article says, because this is a beautiful rug. It was just for sale on rug hooking buy and sell this week. But unfortunately, the admin locked me for some unknown reason that I still don't know why she locked me out. And I missed bidding on it, which broke my heart because I have the rug and I wanted to hook the rug too. But life is life, isn't it? So Hansel and Gretel, um, and this is written by the woman who hooked this version on the cover. I might as well keep this open for you while I share. Um, hooked by Catherine Koverick. Uh, it's 26 by 38, and it's a, it, the pattern is by, officially, Jane McGowan Flynn. So what she says is, just quickly, Hansel and Gretel has always been one of my favorite ch children's tales. I even played the Wicked Stepmother in a college production. I was recently surprised when I found the pattern arrived. Um, she looked at the pattern and saw that even though it was a Jane McGowan pattern, it was actually designed by Anne Setar, S-E-T-A-R. I know, I know, Crystal. It was super, super wind up though. I get so triggered so easily these days. Uh, can't imagine why, right? So much going on that's crazy. But it is a Jane McGowan pattern, but it was designed by Anne Sitar. And she said that was so interesting because Anne was a member of her guild in San Antonio where she began her rug hooking journey. And, she, and Anne had been particularly supportive and friendly to her. And she said she thought instinctively that's why this pattern drew her, even though she didn't know it was drawn by Anne. So that's just an interesting bit of trivia. She said, I used a copy of Hansel and Gretel as a reference for my gingerbread house, as well as finding a variety of clip art of gingerbread houses for Hansel and Gretel online. My goal was to make the roof of the house look like icing, so the wool had to have very light hints of pinks and blues. The candy canes were created from leftover bits of red and white, and the purple accents came from a leftover swatch. Isn't that great when you can use little bits and pieces and throw them in? The hearts came from my scrap bag. Let me show you again. The, the, in this photo, it's not that you're not seeing it well. The roof just looks white. The photo's not super, super crisp. She said the children were fairly air, uh, easy to hook because they were seen from the back. So think about that when you work on your composition. You know, faces and skin tone is hard, but when you show people from the back, you're taking a shortcut and it still looks wonderful. She said, I wanted to step outside my comfort zone and choose to prod the flowers, meaning do proddy. Um, this was my first attempt at Prati after she got instruction from Diana Fultz. So this part here, unlike my rug, these flowers are done with Prati. You see them coming right through. Uh, and again, that was her first attempt, so that was very brave, valiant attempt. 
Uh, the leaves on the right side of the tree were inspired by the fruitless flowering plum that grows in my front yard. Now, isn't that interesting that to incorporate something from your own yard into, to infuse it into the look of the rug, besides using scraps and pieces from other projects to be able to look outside and say, I'm gonna do the leaf that way, like my plum tree. I thought that was so interesting. Um, and then at the end of this article, she talks about how much she used for each part of the house, like house three uh, sixteenths of a yard, that kind of thing. And the only reason I mention that Oh, Heather, that's okay. You can always rewind and look. Um, the only reason I mention that is because in these, if you see these for sale, these Promagown newsletters, there's always a lot of um, very detailed, like Rug Hooking Magazine and Atha, there's always a lot of very detailed information about how much you're, you're going to need to use. So I just thought that was neat that I had the rug, that I had this copy of the rug. That kind of wraps up the fairy tale part of what I want to talk about. Uh, and tomorrow I want to return to... Um, oh, let me just show you this real quick. I just happened to see this also was on the bedside table. In case you love lambs and you want to add Mary yourself, I found this beautiful lamb and the pattern is inside. Uh, Rug Hooking Magazine, September, October, 1989. So I thought that was interesting because I was thinking about lambs. The whole article and the design of this written by Mary Azaro and the actual pattern is in here. So if you're looking at the fairy tale rugs and you think, oh, I'd like to do that or I'd like to adapt something myself, this issue of rug hooking has this beautiful lamb motif that you could easily add to. So tomorrow, let's look into the history of Canada's most famous company, the, the longest company producing commercial designs, uh, Garrett, which is the blue nose patterns. We'll do that tomorrow. In the meantime, have a great day. I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the thread as closely as I should, but it doesn't look like we got spam today. So that's a good one. Thanks, Joelle. I will see you tomorrow with lots of history, especially for people from Canada. It'll be a fun episode. Have a great day in the meantime.